Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. for this last session, that's what Paul meant is for, of the Divinity School. So this is a certain day and it's such a lot of us to be sharing this session. It's so more as a traffic cop, so not to say I'm going to visit the business speakers. The members have to look like it's this, you know, especially invoking the name of Jesus. Brian was appointed to the university
and really a, a beautiful place here. Yeah, I want to say one more general thing before I begin, because in a way I'm dealing with the same introductory text uh, that uh, Frank dealt with, and um, I'm sure that you'll see that we read the text uh, with different emphases, and I have a feeling that my reading will be somewhat more controversial, or at least not uh, conventional, so uh, it should be an interesting uh, comparison here, and um, and also uh, in many ways will reflect on the remarks that Arie made in his presentation about uh, Strauss's uh, introduction, we were not coordinated, but as you'll see, there was a lot, there's a lot, I think, that was going on together between the two of them, and more than certainly meets the eye. By its title, Shlomo Pinus's monumental introduction to his translation of Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed is a study of the philosophic sources of the God. In the body of his essay, there are several references that Pines Pinus makes to his intentions in this introduction. On page 86, in the midst of this discussion of Al-Farabi, the passage that Frank already mentioned, but I'm going to read very differently, in his comments that he will not undertake an extensive comparison of Al-Farabi's and Maimonides' practical philosophy as, quote, in most cases, such an exact and extensive comparison would not result in the discovery of more or less certain or at least very probable sources of Maimonides, which, uh, Penis adds in parentheses, is the philological task with which the present introduction is, and I want to emphasize the next word, mainly concerned. Not exclusively concerned, but mainly concerned. There is no doubt that in reading Penis's introduction, its most obvious characteristic is a comprehensive study of the various philosophers whose writings influenced or may have influenced Maimonides when he wrote the God. Indeed, the structure of the introduction itself, 16 sections, an untitled opening section, and 15 sections titled with the names of various specific thinkers or groups, points the reader to Penis's philological undertaking of finding the probable sources that Maimonides used or was influenced by in writing the God. Yet, as Penis noted above, the introduction is not exclusively, but only mainly concerned with this philological text. And Penis, as a careful writer, alerts our attention to what I imagine a careful reader will notice. It is not merely the philological undertaking that motivates Penis, but the attempt to discern as much as is possible the true teachings of Maimonides, teachings that often are hidden. The opening four and a half pages of the introduction, which are devoted to Maimonides, but are not an attempt to present an overview of his thought, seem to be divided between one, comments on Maimonides' style of writing in the guide, including a discussion of the reasons that motivated Maimonides to write esoterically, and two, a review of the letter that Maimonides wrote to Shmuel and Tibon that gives us, quote, invaluable indications regarding Maimonides' attitude toward earlier philosophers, end of quote. From these first pages of the introduction, I would like to know the passage where I believe Venus Penis's comments on the writing style of the guy also apply, at least in a limited fashion, to Penis's own direct evaluation of Maimonides' positions in the guy, which appears to be the main non-philological subject with which Penis is concerned in the introduction. Penis states that in contrast to the orderly presentation in the Mishnah, the Mishnah Torah, in the guy, quote, the systematic expressions of the Aristotelian philosophers are often dislocated and broken up. Sometimes wholly unconnected subjects are brought together in a word order is turned into disorder. I'm not contending that there is disorder in Penis's discussion of the various thinkers who he imagines, because I'm going to compare this to Penis. I'm not contending that there is disorder in Penis's discussion of the various thinkers whom he examines in the separate subsections of the introduction. The discussion of each of the sources that Penis presents is usually undertaken in an ordered fashion. However, I do want to suggest that in his introduction, Penis's own philosophical interpretation of Maimonides' thought is often dislocated and broken up. The ongoing discussion of issues being discussed in various sections, with the discussion of certain issues appearing in unexpected locations. Shlomo Penis was a careful writer who undertook to understand texts written by philosophers, theologians, and others, many of whom he understood to be careful writers. 
and some of whom, like Maimonides, Venus recognized work in an esoteric, exoteric style in order to limit the accessibility to their thought to a select group of readers. It would seem fair to me to state that Venus, by temperament and by choice, was not inclined to write in an overly esoteric style or to teach esoterically. That is not to say that it is always easy to understand the implications of his thought or that his style of writing is always graceful. But these elements of his writing style usually do not seem to be the result of an attempt to hide his teaching, rather perhaps to present his teaching in an accurate fashion, indicating that certain of his conclusions are probable rather than absolutely certain or for other reasons. Certainly, in his later writings on Maimonides, one is struck with Venus's open style in presenting philosophical positions contained in Maimonides' a lot of writings and in the guide that would appear uh, that Maimonides attempted not to highlight, even if they were present. Returning to Venus's introduction to the guide, it appears to me that there is an element of esoteric writing that permeates the introduction regarding Venus's evaluation of certain of Maimonides' positions a style of writing that can lead one to lose sight of Venus's own ongoing interpretation of Maimonides' guide and, sh and concentrate chiefly on Venus's survey of ancient and particular medieval Arabic philosophers and other thinkers whose texts may or may not have influenced Maimonides. The very structure of Venus's text promotes this view of the introduction, which in itself clearly is an important groundbreaking aim. I'm not trying to deny that that's an important part of the guide. It certainly is, of the introduction to the guide. It certainly is. Yet to be sure, or should I say indubitably, <laughs> careful reading of the introduction makes it clear that Venus is also strongly interested in presenting his own evaluation of Maimonides' guide in its own right frequently using the jumping off point of his discussion of the various thinkers whose works are compared to Maimonides' guide. A further point that I would like to note is that not all of the subsections are actually devoted to the philosophic sources of the guide, as is indicated in the title of the introduction. Some of the thinkers examined by Penis's own assertions did not influence Maimonides or serve as sources for the guide, and other subsections deal with non-philosophic writers. The most important example of the first group is Averroes, Ibn Rush, whose subsection is the longest subsection in the introduction, and about whom Penis states, at least in his own words, quote, there is no conclusive proof that at the time of the writing of the guide, Maimonides was in any way influenced by Averroes' doctrines, even when they had similar ideas. The comparison with Averroes, including comparisons to the Avicenna's positions that are reviewed in the Averroes section, is used to suggest positions, at least in my opinion, that Maimonides accepted or may have accepted, or particularly in the case of the comparison with Avicenna, positions that Maimonides chooses not to accept, even though they were less problematic from the perspective of the Jewish tradition or Jewish theology. I would note that much of the Averroes section, especially its final pages, deals directly with Maimonides' thought and not with Averroes' thought, even when Averroes or other philosophers are mentioned, and that a significant number of paragraphs toward the end of the section deal with Platonic political theory, in Venus' own words, including what Venus calls Maimonides' use of noble fiction in the Platonic sense of the word, I'm quoting. Uh, this point will be expanded on later in my presentation. It is perhaps worthy of note that there is only a brief reference to Plato's political theory in the subsection of the introduction devoted to Plato himself. In that section, Venus makes one brief reference to Strauss and concludes by stating that no attempt can be made to present uh, in the present introduction to delimit and define the influence it's uh, exercised by Plato on the, on the guide in this field. While this comment is accompanied with a reference to the section dealing with Al-Farabi, which indeed contains part of Venus's discussion of Plato's political theory, there is no mention of the Averroes section where Platonic political theory is also discussed explicitly, and I would say to a certain extent uh, with great importance. Regarding an example of the second exception, that's to say non-philosophic sources, at least in Venus's way of looking at it, and I will note only briefly that the section on the Kalam discusses thinkers who Venus 
definitely perceives as theologians rather than as philosophers, who in addition were thinkers strongly criticized by Maimonides, for his penis states about which Maimonides clearly expressed intellectual contempt. Nevertheless, Venus uses part of this section to clarify certain positions that Maimonides expresses in the guide without citing the Kalam thinkers, when, as Venus puts it, quote, for practical reasons, out of public spirit, Maimonides chose to aid and abet the faithful adherence of religion by using doctrines from the Kalam, even if he doesn't mention them, even though, again I quote, he belonged as far as his overriding intellectual convictions were concerned to the opposite camp. Before turning to a brief overview of a number of the substantive issues of Maimonides' philosophic thought that Venus discusses in his introduction, I would like to say something about academic studies on Maimonides' God of the Perplexed prior to the time of the publication of Venus' translation in comparison to our own time. I think that it would be a fair generalization that far more than today, pre-1960s Maimonidean studies of the guy were far less open in their exposure or discussion of Maimonides' most controversial philosophic and radically non-traditional positions on certain issues, which Maimonides himself tried to conceal. Of course, many authors didn't think that there were things that uh, uh, were controversial, perhaps, in what Maimonides wrote, but there certainly were others who did. The esotericism in Maimonides' writings was certainly a theme in Leo Strauss's writing and in his introduction, and other writings Strauss made, and other writings Strauss, and in other writings Strauss made every effort to preserve the distinction between what would be revealed openly and what he himself wrote in an esoteric fashion, even if he gave his readers keys as to how to discover Maimonides' hidden teaching. The opening section of Venus's introduction reminds us of this matter, as Venus almost immediately contrasts the Mishnah Torah, where Maimonides attempted to produce order out of the chaotic disorder of Talmudic literature, with the guide, where in a word order, the systematic expositions of the Aristotelian philosophers is turned into disorder. As I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, I think that Venus was far more cautious in presenting what he thought were Maimonides' real teachings on these sensitive matters than he was in other of his writings, particularly his later writings. Perhaps the very public support and general focus on Venus's new translation of the guy, or his collaboration with Leo Strauss, or as perhaps, as was suggested by Alfred at the first day of the conference, perhaps that Venus was not entirely his own man in this project. In any event, all of these and perhaps other considerations were significant things that might have led Venus to present his own interpretation of Maimonides' thought in a cautious and perhaps even esoteric manner. Thus, I would argue, Venus' interpretation of the guy often is spread out over various sections of the introduction and at least on occasion is connected by various stylistic or literal hints. This is not to say that Venus tempers his critical evaluation of Maimonides' position, rather that Venus forces the qualified and patient reader to work hard to clarify his analysis of Maimonides' positions. Some support for seeing the second thematic level of discourse in the introduction that contains Venus' commentary on the guy can be found in Joel Kramer's and Joseph Stern's article, Shlomo Venus on the Translation of Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed. In note 21 of this article, it reports, quote, although Venus did refer many years later to a commentary he had intended to publish with his translation, Personal Communication from Alfred Avery to Joseph Stern, by which he may have been referring to the interpretive notes that were previously mentioned in the article, there is no evidence that he ever put this project into writing. It is also possible that Venus incorporated some of the material for the, quote, interpretive notes or commentary into his magisterial introduction to his translation, end quote. It seems to me that there is at least a possibility that if Venus abandoned the idea of writing a separate commentary, analyzing Maimonides' positions in the guide, what he contemplated may well have been channeled into his introduction on the philosophic sources of the guide of the perplexed. What then are some of the substantive issues in Maimonides' thought that Venus evaluated and sometimes discussed in detail in his introduction. 
often expressing his interpretation in the first person or emphasizing his comments in other ways. Uh, I would group the issues that Penis discussed into the following rough areas, although the issues that I list clearly are not an exhaustive list of all of the topics that are covered in, in the introduction. One, the essence of the divine and what can or cannot be said about God. This area includes Penis' attempt to present Maimonides' own position in contrast to the positions that Penis claims that Maimonides presents to non-philosophers or to what Penis calls, quote, faithful adherence of religion. Some of the central issues that Penis identifies here are the connection between nature and God or between physics and metaphysics. On the other hand, Penis's treatment of Maimonides' discussion of creation or eternality of the world, as well as his discussion of negative attributes, will, re will be grouped with subjects that Penis attributes to Maimonides' presentation for non-philosophers and adherence of religion, and so it's not appropriate for this category. Two, the character of human perfection. This group of subjects includes the supremacy of the theoretical life or practical activities as well as the possibility of attaining unity or connection with the active intellect, and issues related to the question of the immortality of the soul. Prophecy, which may or may not be the symbol of human perfection, will be discussed in a different set of issues uh, for reasons that will become apparent in what follows. Three, the connection between the divine and human spheres. I group here Penis's presentation of Maimonides' position regarding the active intellect, including the intermediate intermittence of the activity of the active intellect. I also group here, perhaps surprisingly, the subject of divine providence, particularly in the context of Venus's discussion of Epicurus, although not in the context of the more popular discussion of divine providence uh, elsewhere in his introduction. While the discussion of prophecy might seem to be appropriate for discussion here, it will be discussed elsewhere and not here as well. On the basis of Penis's comments regarding Maimonides' discussion of prophecy as an example of Maimonides' use of, quote, noble fictions in the platonic sense of the word. That's what he has to say about the example of prophecy. The final two categories are interconnected and may be said in a broad way to examine Penis's comments on Maimonides' political, perhaps in quotation marks, considerations when he wrote the guide. Four, uh, issues relating to the conflict between religion and philosophy that are discussed in the guide, which include discussions of the essence of this conflict, as well as the differences between the support of philosophic understanding in parts of the guide, while other parts of the guide emphasize the limitations and flaws of, the, of philosophic science and the philosophic life. This above, these, ab these above discussions in many ways follow from Penis' comments on Maimonides' purpose in writing the guide, which in Penis' opinion is essential to explain the significance of the different and sometimes conflicting positions that Maimonides presents in the guide. Finally, five, Penis' direct discussion of Maimonides' political thought, including both the importance of laws and beliefs, including the character of specific attainment of the character and specific attainments of the Jewish law, what should be the philosopher's understanding of the place of law and religious beliefs, and Maimonides' understanding of what beliefs and other matters are appropriate to express to non-philosophers and to believers in the truth of religion, particularly among his co-religionists. This group of issues also includes prophecy as a part of political philosophy, uh, as, uh, and I'll quote this in a moment, uh, which uh, uh, Penis uh, writes, prophecy is a part of political philosophy and of an anthropology going back in many essentials to Plato. Uh, and this point is, point is alluded to in Penis's Al-Farabi section and presented more explicitly in his Averroi section. To be certain, it would be possible to discuss additional subjects of Maimonides' commentary on the guide, or to group the issues that I've mentioned in a different fashion, but the wealth of issues that I have mentioned point to the overall scope of Penis's commentary and analysis of the guide in his introduction. I believe that the structure of the introduction, which is based around the identification of Maimonides' sources, serves to a greater or lesser extent 
to obscure not only the scope, but particularly the occasional radicalness of Penis's analysis of Maimonides' positions. In my opinion, it may be said to point to an esoteric way of treating with many of those very subjects that Maimonides attempted to obscure from easy understanding. In the time that remains, I would like to discuss some of the particular issues that I've noted above. The first issue, which relates to the essence of God, is presented in a somewhat unusual manner by Penis, who chooses to present this issue in at least three different sections of the introduction, each making reference to Book 1, Chapter 68 of the Guide. They can make reference to this chapter as well. It occurring at a distance of exactly 18 pages between appearances. That is, on pages 79, 97, and 150. While elsewhere, Penis himself noted that as a rule, attempts to show that Maimonides, is made, that Maimonides made use of numerology seem unconvincing, Penis does note exceptions to this rule, in particular in note 16 of the philosophic purport of Maimonides' Elaphic Works and the purport of the Guide of the Perplexed. Penis's first reference to 168 of the Guide in Penis's introduction, in, in the introduction, occurs on page 79 in the Al-Farabi section. Here, Penis notes that Al-Farabi may be said to have hidden, actually, and now I want to quote, uh, Penis says that Al-Farabi may be said to have hidden, quote, outrageously unorthodox and startlingly, and starting, startlingly plain-spoken statements by using a very abstract and very precise style, end of quote. Penis then notes, without any context of issues, that in the guide, uh, for instance, in parentheses he writes this, for instance, in in Book 1, Chapter 68, end of parentheses, and Maimonides, in a similar manner to Al-Farabi, also makes, quote, disconcertingly unorthodox statements, perhaps rendered innocuous by their abstract formulation, end of quote. I would like to mention here, so to speak, in parentheses, that a significant number of penises important hints to his ideas or line of thought appear in parentheses in his text. Although obviously these types of indications are the minority of those instances where penises uses parentheses. But I did notice that very frequently when he said something that was really out of the ordinary, it was in parentheses. To continue tracing penises' references to Guide 168, nothing more is said of 168 or the subject of these unorthodox statements until 18 pages later. On page 97, in the context of the subsection on obviously. Here, after twice referring to 168, Maimonides continues by discussing the implications of Maimonides' position regarding God's engagement in intellectual cognition, an idea that Venus points out goes counter to negative theology, about which more will be said later. According to Venus, Maimonides either strictly circumscribes God's cognition only to himself, or if God, quote, does cognize the system of forms, parentheses, and we might add, using a later term of natural laws, in the parentheses, subsisting in the universe, he must be held in view of the Aristotelian thesis stressed by Maimonides, that's also parentheses, to be identical with these forms and laws, i.e., with the scientific system of the universe. That's to say, God must be identical with the scientific system of the universe. In my opinion, Venus writes, undoubtedly, no, in my opinion, I write, in my opinion, undoubtedly to emphasize the above disconcertingly unorthodox position. But Venus follows with an uncharacteristically brief and almost uni uniquely phrased paragraph uh, that was mentioned earlier uh, by Tzvi, in noting that if Maimonides was not aware of the evident consequences of the position that he presents on, my, on God's engagement in intellectual cognition, quote, this would amount to a grave and, in my opinion, very implausible accusation of muddle-headedness directed against Maimonides, end of quote. So I understand that quotation somewhat differently than the Yemenite referred to. And Venus returns to 168 and to Maimonides' unorthodox treatment of the essence of God once again after another 18 pages, on page 115, in the section on Averroes. 
Here Venus sums up what he has already noted about 168 as follows. It's not really a summary, but he says he sums it up. If we follow up Maimonides' hints to their logical conclusion that God may be identical with the system of the sciences, including the physical sciences, this may imply a higher evaluation of natural science than any that may be found in the Averroes' works. And again, quote, now if the conclusions that have been drawn from 168 are correct, this knowledge of the system of nature may represent the essence of God. This may mean that God is identical with the system of the natural sciences, end of quote. To be sure, the position that Venus describes to Maimonides regarding the essence of God is a matter that would be problematic from the perspective of traditional Jewish beliefs and undoubtedly justifies his original comment on 168 that appears without reference to the issue involved, that 168 is an example of Maimonides' use of, quote, disconcertingly unorthodox statements, perhaps rendered innocuous by their abstract formulation. A second set of issues discussed by Venus, it relates to Maimonides' position in the guide regarding the character of human perfection. Is human perfection attained through theoretical perfection, or does it require, or perhaps even not go beyond, practical perfection? In this context, is it possible for the human intellect to attain union or connection with the active intellect, and does human perfection lead to the immortality of the soul in some form? It appears that in his later writings, Venus arrives at different conclusions than the perhaps certainly more ambiguous ones expressed in his introduction here. But since the subject of Joseph's presentation relates to this issue, I will limit myself to Venus' statements and analysis in the introduction. Regarding the philosophers, that's, regarding the philosophers, that is to say the perfect individual's theoretical activity, in the section devoted to Averroes, Venus states that Maimonides, like Al-Farabi, seems to have thought that theoretical philosophic activity, the supreme attainment, should be, quote, rounded off by being combined with practical activity. That's in page 121 of the introduction. This is said to be a kind of imitation of God, or one might say of the natural laws, that are the causes of what happens in the world, without being aware of how the particular events affect individual circumstances. Penis notes that this kind of practical activity would be without regret felt by Plato's philosopher who was required to return to the cave. One might say that Penis chooses to highlight this point by virtue of the fact that 25 pages earlier, on page 97, in the section devoted to Al-Farabi, he states in his, known, in, in his own name, a coming attraction. He says he has a paragraph that doesn't connect to anything. Anticipating a little, I'm quoting here, anticipating a little, I shall add to this, interpre to this interpretation to explain in a rather unusual way what the imitation of God required by the philosophers and by Jewish tradition really means. I kept waiting for that passage to come. So it came 25 pages later. <laughs> He mentions there without explanation that, quote, in some respects, Maimonides gives it, the imitation of God, a more striking, because more controversial, expression than the Arabic Aristotelian philosophers with whom he is in essential agreement on these matters. End of uh, quote. That's again from 97. Perhaps to balance the expression of practical human activity in contrast to the attainment of human perfection through theoretical perfection, at the end of the Averroes section, Penis also notes, after he said that uh, Maimonides tops off, rounds off, something like that, the uh, uh, theoretical life with the political concern that he has, uh, after that, uh, Penis also notes that he reads the final chapter of the guide in a way different from those who see it as presenting the ascendancy of the ordinary moral virtues and moral actions over the intellectual virtues and the theoretical way of life. Although, I should note, this statement on the lower status of moral virtues and moral actions stops short of characterizing the theoretical life as fully achievable, where the practical life is totally identical to moral virtues and actions. What can be stated clearly about the immortality of the human soul which is also connected to the question of human perfection, is that despite Maimonides' comments in the section devoted to Galen, 
that the guy, quote, does not contain an explicit discussion of the immortality of the soul, end of quote, Penis does return to this subject a number of times, clearly stating that Maimonides rejects, on page 103, he rejects the idea of individualized immortality of the soul, as was presented by Avicenna, and which would have provided Maimonides with a philosophic source for belief, quote, that was much less obnoxious from the religious point of view than his own. End of quote. That's page 102. According to Penis, while it seems that Maimonides accepts that Moses attained, quote, an unindividualized afterlife as well as union with the active intellect, end of quote, Maimonides' position on the point regarding Moses alone or by Moses and others is ambiguous, at least in my opinion, and there are reasons to believe that Maimonides' statements on Moses' union with the active intellect are contradicted elsewhere in the guide, making it one of this book's intentional contradictions. Before moving to the next issue, I would like to emphasize the point that I stated above, Penis' statement regarding Maimonides' rejection of a number of Avicenna's, Avicenna's positions. While Penis clearly notes that on these points, Avicenna's position is not a source for Maimonides' position in the guide, so it's really not a philosophic source of the guy from that point of view, perhaps. Avicenna's, uh, Penis's discussion of these positions in the introduction is important for Penis, as it allows him to more accurately elucidate uh, what Penis perceives to be the road not taken by Maimonides. This is an important element in Penis's interpretation of the guide that can be drawn out of his introduction that, that can be drawn out of his introduction by Penis's careful readers. Penis states, quote, in fact, as has already been suggested, the importance of a comparison between his, Maimonides' doctrines, and Avicenna's is to be found partly in the fact that it permits us to gauge the steadfastness of Maimonides' often tacit rejection of philosophic beliefs that were much less obnoxious uh, from the religious point of view than his own. <clears throat> I've grouped, now moving on to the third category, I've grouped Penis' interpretation of Maimonides' position on divine providence in the general class of issues related to the connection between the divine and the human spheres. It is true that divine providence also could be considered within the context of issues related to the conflict between religion and philosophy, or perhaps even <clears throat> the noble fictions of Maimonides' political thought, this is quite obvious, as it is quite obvious that Maimonides does not accept the traditional Jewish concept of divine providence, where God looks over and assists the righteous believers, even though, as we learned on Sunday in Alfred Ivory's presentation, Penis's translation speaks of divine providence, quote, watching over some individuals more than others. It, the usual non-traditional interpretation of Maimonides' idea of divine providence might be said naturally to connect that providence to the perfection of the intellect or to the attainment of human wisdom. Penis, however, may be said to emphasize his understanding of Maimonides' position by his perhaps unexpected comments on providence in the context of his very, very brief remarks on Epicurus. Prior to the discussion in the Epicurus section, there is a limited discussion of divine providence in the Alexander <coughs> Aphrodisius section, where Penis notes that, quote, as far as individual beings and any individual events are concerned, and the quote, the per peripatetic doctrine, quote, denies any intervention of providence, and the quote, although Penis cites a conventional saying, it is generally believed, from Aristotle's Ethics, Book 10, Chapter 8, which Venus notes, quote, foreshadows, that it foreshadows Maimonides' view that the human individual's share in divine providence is proportionate to his intellectual powers, end of quote. Having said this, and perhaps in order to resolve the seeming contradiction between the peripatetic's denial of any intervention of providence on individual beings and Aristotle's conventional saying that indicates that the belief that divine providence is proportionate to the development of an individual's intellect, Penis returns to Maimonides' position on divine providence in the context of the section on Epicurus. Here, after stating explicitly that Epicurus's denial of providence was known to Maimonides, 
Pina states that Maimonides, quote, Maimonides generally believed as much as the Epicureans in the working out of efficient causes. And then Pina adds in parentheses, i.e., a blind chance or of a necessity, two terms that are in this context equivalent. End of parentheses. <coughs> Thus, the fact that man's reason may help him to elude the dangers with which external necessity threatened him, or to adopt an attitude that would alleviate or nullify the latter's impact, was recognized, though with differences of formulations, by the Epicureans as well as by Maimonides and other Aristotelians. End of quote. <coughs> From this perspective, Maimonides makes it clear that the world operates in its independent manner as a result of efficient causes that, from the context of its effects on man, can very well be categorized as blind chance or some natural necessity, and that reason can do no more than assisting to a greater or lesser degree the ability of a wise individual to overcome some of these challenges, there being no guarantee that human reason of the philosopher or any other individual will also provide a, quote, providential solution to the challenges that such an individual faces. Uh, I note in passing that in this particular case, Peter does not emphasize his position by writing in the first person that this is his view. Rather, he seems to present his analysis as fact. He does, however, add near the beginning of this brief section that Epicurus's position might have been, but was not recognized by Maimonides as presenting a serious challenge to Aristotelianism, as well as to the orthodox religious attitude. Page 76, end of quote. I now would like to turn to some of Penis's comments on Maimonides' aims in writing the guide, comments that appear in a number of places in the introduction, including most significantly in his footnotes, especially footnote 96, which, is, which clearly is the longest footnote in the introduction. This marks the beginning of my examination of examples of the last two groups of issues in the introduction, which examined Venus's comments on Maimonides' political considerations when he wrote the guide. One of Venus's earliest comments on Maimonides' project in writing the guide, on page 58, which appears in the opening section, before the section centered on the various philosophic sources of the guide, is that Maimonides was not interested in giving, quote, the sufficiently qualified readers of the guide a way to discover the beliefs sincerely held by Maimonides, end of quote, but only to give them, quote, an inkling of the true nature of things, end of quote. Perhaps it is unnecessary to note to this audience that elsewhere, Penis does not see the aim of the guide as reaching a real conciliation between religion and philosophy, although as Penis contends, it seems to me, he writes, in my mind, he may have wanted to create this impression in the mind of various classes of his readers. On page 89 in the Al-Farabi section of the introduction, Venus comments that to some degree, at least the purpose of the guide may be fairly described as political. I might add, that's me, that I think that Venus here means political in the Jewish context, or perhaps even again, to some degree, and not in its totality, as a project in good citizenship in the Jewish community. Uh, this maybe reminds us of some, some things that Arya presented in his presentation on Strauss, Strauss's introduction. In this context, I would like to refer to two of Penis's footnotes in the introduction. In footnote 89 on page 111, Penis puts forward the idea that it was Maimonides' intention in book two of the guide to overstate his critique of Greek science, quote, in order to shape the confidence of a certain class of readers in the philosophic doctrines of the eternity of the world, a confidence that was certainly connected with belief in the trustworthiness of Greek science in general, end of quote. This despite the fact that in 172, or in general in books 1 and 2, chapter 1 of book 2, Maimonides presents a much less doubting picture about the eternity of the world, which it would seem Penis thinks is far closer to Maimonides' own views. I think that the most revealing statement on this point, which relates both to Maimonides' aims in the guide and the conflict that Venus identifies between Maimonides' positions in Book 1 and in Book 2, the competing positions, 
It appears in footnote 96, which I have already identified as the longest footnote in the introduction. Here, after noting that the guide is in many ways the contrary of a systematic presentation of a philosophic doctrine, Venus presents what he sees to be the twofold purpose of the guide. One, to direct the potential philosophers or his readers to philosophic knowledge, which was only hinted at in the guide, knowledge that then, quote, could be acquired from the study of the works of Aristotle and his commentators and ex expositors, end of quote, and two, quote, to prevent these potential philosophers, to prevent these potential philosophers from acquiring the indifference toward the specific form of Jewish law and tradition that could be considered the hallmark of the philosopher who, living as he does a theoretical life, is not concerned with the outward forms of legal and cultic observance or with popular, popular religious beliefs, end of quote. Penis, commenting in this footnote on the first name of the guide, states, if the guide was intended to bring about by itself the required confirmation of philosophers in potential into actual philosophers, it could not but fail in this task, whereas an adequate knowledge of philosophy could be acquired from the study of the works of Aristotle and his commentators and expositors. End of quote a role to which a student should be directed. Yet Maimonides and the guide also felt the responsibility to attempt to ensure that those potential philosophers did not lose sight of their own Jewish community and its needs for responsible leadership that would not undermine the stability and continuity of the Jewish community and the vast majority of its members who were not on the same high road as the one on which the potential philosophers were about to travel. <coughs> On account of this second object, Penis contends, political life had to be accorded a higher status in the guide than was the case in Ibn Bajo or perhaps in Aristotle. These comments by Penis on the aims of the guide, at least in his opinion, not only explain why Maimonides wanted to overstate his critique of Greek science, but it would appear they also explain Maimonides' emphasis in certain contexts on the practical of political life and its connection with human perfection. It is true that this does not necessarily remove doubts about Maimonides' reservations regarding the possibility of attaining union with, with the active intellect, or the absolute possibility of living the theoretical life, positions, it seems to me, regarding which Venus expresses some doubt in the introduction, but which nevertheless differ from the positions that he expressed in 1979, but again, Joseph will undoubtedly talk about that, However, they do place Venus' evaluation of Maimonides' position within a context that reduces the necessity of accepting at face value Venus' critique of the possibility of attaining union with the active intellect or the ultimate possibility and supremacy of living the theoretical life. Just as Venus raises doubts about Maimonides' exaggeration of the critique of Greek science, part of which was undi undeniably warranted and held by Maimonides, but another part of which uh, Venus identifies as overstated. The same political motivation on Maimonides', Maimonides part may bring us to the conclusion that Maimonides' doctrine of the negative attributes of God, which Venus points out was not only held by Avicenna, but also by unnamed authors who were much less respectable than Avicenna, and whose texts were used by Maimonides, is only designed in uh, that Maimonides' doctrine of neg negative attributes of God is only designed for certain types of readers who are not philosophers. A point that Joseph Stern referred to in his opening remarks regarding the lecture that Venus gave in 1955, and which seems to be the point that Venus makes in the Avicenna section of his introduction when discussing the theory of negative attributes. Uh, Ken Siskin talked about this, and I'm running late, so I think I won't say much more about this at all. Um, I'll move on to what follows. Perhaps it is even easier to see that according to Venus, the above-mentioned political motivation at least in part lies behind Maimonides' theory of prophecy. Uh, but I want to say more about Venus' political thought before I do that. I'm not sure how much time I have left. Do we have to go home tonight? 
I'm not sure you have any opinion. The flights are all canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps it is even easier to see that according to Venus, it's sort of like the, the banquet at Plato's Republic that never gets served. Is that the idea? Perhaps it is even easier to see that according to Venus, the above mentioned political motivation, at least in part, lies behind Maimonides' theory of prophecy. But before I talk about that, I want to say some preliminary remarks on Maimonides' political thought as presented by Venus in the introduction. I have left the direct examination of Venus' discussion of Maimonides' political thought for last, although I have already referred to this aspect of Venus' reading of the guide. As mentioned, near the beginning of my remarks, Penis states that no attempt, quote, no attempt can be made in the present introduction to delimit and define the influence exercised by Plato on the, on the guide in this field, that is, in the field of political thought broadly defined, by which Penis includes the philosophic use of veiled language and the need, the political necessity, to employ it, end of quote. Notwithstanding this statement by Penis, a Platonic political theory is discussed both in the Alfarabi section and in the Averroes section, and Penis's comments on the need or political necessity of overemphasizing or un underemphasizing various doctrines, positions, or truths, as well as other aspects of Maimonides' writing that reflect this political necessity, appear throughout the essay. In his brief remarks on the political influences from Plato that do appear in the Plato section, and Plato comments that this theme is bound up with others, and as I've already mentioned, he specifically indicates prophecy is the most important issue that it's bound up with. And what follows, I will expand on the hint that Venus gives here regarding his view on the connection between uh, 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 prophecy and Maimonides' political thought generally defined, which Venus links to influences from Plato's political at the beginning of the Al-Farabi section, Venus identif identifies, quote, the philosophic position with respect to the theory of prophecy is part of a political philosophy and of an anthropology going back in many essentials to Plato, end of quote. And Penis contends that it was, quote, set forth by Al-Farabi in a style and mode of expression that possibly influenced Maimonides as much as the doctrines themselves. Penis mentions other doctrines about, this might, about which this might also be held, but emphasizes that the theory of prophecy is, quote, perhaps the most important of all. After this promising second mentioning of prophecy, Penis turns to discuss other subjects and returns to Maimonides' theory of prophecy seven pages later on page 86, where he states that Maimonides' views, quote, on the, Maimonides' quote, views on the nature and function of prophecy and on the twofold purpose of the good city stem from Al Farabi's conceptions, end of quote. Although he indicates that none of Al Farabi's writings is, quote, as carefully designed as is the guide to throw the unqualified readers and many qualified ones off the right track, end of quote. I might note that this qualification regarding the stylistic difference between Al Farabi and Maimonides is in contrast to the unqualified character of Venus's comments on Maimonides' position on the nature and function of prophecy itself, which are said to stem from Al-Farabi's conception, conceptions, as he notes later, that were developed under the strong influence of Plato's political philosophy. Here again, after broaching the subject of Maimonides' theory of prophecy, Penis turns to, the, to comment on other matters, as he states and that it is difficult to determine the precise sources of the whole of Maimonides' practical philosophy. I've already read that. In that section, and, the, and also Frank read in that section. And be that as it may, Penis spends the next several pages discussing Aristotle's political thought in comparison to Plato's political thought before returning to Maimonides, where Penis comments that, quote, to some degree at least, the purpose that Maimonides had in mind when writing the guide may be fairly described as political. In this context, Penis returns to the discussion of Maimonides' well-known theory of prophecy that Moses accepted, with the exception of Moses, both the prophets have the same kind of theoretical knowledge as the philosophers, end of uh, quote, and our philosopher, and our philosophers, however, they also have a highly developed imaginative faculty. Moses, however, who was the supreme prophet, in Penis' terms, 
Their also being a lawgiver and a founder of the community is presented as attaining prophecy without connection to his imaginative fact. Venus continues by identifying ambiguity regarding the question whether Moses achieved union with the active intellect, an issue that appears more connected to the question of human perfection and the possibility of human connection with the active intellect than it is related to our present subject, except to the extent that claiming that Moses' legislative prophecy is purely the result of the intellectual faculty is a political position that makes the Mosaic law appear unchangeable in contrast to the limitations of the revealed law if, imag if imaginative elements related to time, place, and the relative rational abilities of the recipients of that prophecy are attributed to my Mon my Moses' prophecy. In other words, it's important to say Moses didn't have imaginative elements because that would undermine the picture of that prophecy as unchanging and perfect. Pinus Penis briefly returns to the question of Maimonides' theory of prophecy in the Avicenna section, noting that it is an unprofitable speculation whether Maimonides and Al-Farabi permitted themselves to be aware of the lack of any historical evidence for the contention that the prophets were philosophers, but that, quote, Maimonides fairly certainly knew, end of quote, that the view that the prophets only differed from the philosophers by having a more vigorous imagination was regarded as derogatory to the prophets and this being the case, Maimonides had so little use for Avicenna's attempt to connect the prophetic experience to mystical knowledge. Venus's comments here are typical of his use of opinions that are not sources of the guide to show that doctrines to show the doctrines that Maimonides rejected, in this case and others by a respected philosopher that could have been more easily accepted uh, within the traditional believing Jewish community. It appears to me that the most revealing statements that Venus makes about Maimonides' theory of prophecy occur in the Averroes section, in several pages that are devoted to a renewed discussion of Platonic political theory. It does not appear to me that anything that appears in this section is in contradiction to Venus' early remarks on Maimonides' theory of prophecy, but I do think that much that was ambiguous is clarified here and that Venus speaks quite openly about the underlying character of Maimonides' Maimonides theory of prophecy, making disconcertingly unorthodox statements that are highlighted by a surprisingly blunt statement rather than rendered innocuous by abstract formulation. And to remind us of Venus' comments on Maimonides that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, but there he didn't talk about a, a surprisingly blunt statement uh, or rather, he talked about abstract formulation. Venus returns to the comment that he made in his previous discussion of prophecy that appeared in the Avicenna section and states that, quote, the way in which Maimonides carried out his project in the guide quite evidently signifies that this work is centered on the proposition that the prophets are philosophers. And the quote, while Venus, in keeping with his early remarks, continues by saying, quote, what Maimonides really thought about this is anybody's guess, and is an unprofitable conjecture. He proceeds, however, now to reveal his own analysis of Maimonides' undertaking, which given the overall analysis that Venus has presented may fairly certainly be assumed to be the position that Venus interprets, interprets as Maimonides' own position. Venus states that the view that the prophets were philosophers which is not supported by any evidence whatsoever, quote, may be legitimately qualified as a noble fiction in the platonic sense of the word, end of quote. In justifying this noble fiction, Venus continues, quote, the fact that in the period after Maimonides, Aristotelian philosophy could become an integral part of the way of life of the Jewish elite, or a considerable portion of it, is largely due to the acceptance of this fiction, end of quote. Penis continues by pointing to the Platonic division of mankind into three classes, which is adopted by the medieval Arabic and Jewish Aristotelian philosophers, uh, that is, the actual philosophers, potential philosophers, and non-philosophers. While the third class, the non-philosophers, have to be kept in line, and according to Penis, the Mishnah Torah was concerned with this task, Penis argues that Maimonides in the guide, like Plato in some of his dialogues, was concerned quote, with the potential philosophers who have to be recognized as such and turned into active philosophers. And unlike Aristotle and Averroes, Maimonides did not have in mind 
a reading of or a reading public made up of actual philosophers. End of quote. In other words, the reading public that he's writing to in the guide is not actual philosophers, but potential philosophers. According to Maimonides, this concern with recognizing and guiding the potential philosophers was a political activity. Political is in quotation marks in Penis's introduction. It held a very high degree in Maimonides' quote, scale of values. According to this understanding of the political purpose of the guide, the positions presented should be evaluated. The positions that uh, Maimonides presents should be evaluated. Thus, while Penis argues here that while Maimonides did not think that the theoretical way of life was overappreciated by the philosophers, that's a quote, he emphasized the importance of political involvement by the philosopher, according to Penis, perhaps even more so than Plato in the Republic, who required the philosopher to return to the cave, and I mentioned this before, but did not attempt to mitigate the regret that they must feel in being torn from the pure conception of the eternal truths and obliged the government to oppose. These comments, in my opinion, appear to show that at least in the introduction, in contrast to his later writings, Penis is not convinced of the impossibility of the attainment of the theoretical life according to Maimonides, even though he recognizes Maimonides' ambiguity regarding this point, which appears to be motivated by political motivations. Regarding Penis' interpretation of Maimonides' theory of prophecy itself, it should be clear that his interpretation of the prophets undoubtedly including by Moses, must be read as a political doctrine that is put forward in a way similar to the political doctrines that Plato presents in the, Repu in the Republic through the vehicle of his noble fictions. As no time remains, I have one more page. Although no time remains, that's what I wrote. <laughs> I, I must at least touch on one additional political topic that appears in Venus's introduction, his understanding of Maimonides' treatment of the divine Mosaic law. Stated very, very, very briefly, while Venus points out that in some, well, some chapters of the guide, Maimonides posits the traditional Jewish position that the Jewish law is divine, unique, and the most perfect that law that can be, that can be Nevertheless, Penis indicates that Maimonides' position about the perfection and unchanging character of the divine Mosaic law is far less definite than it seems, recalling remarks that Strauss, that you mentioned from Strauss. I will cite three brief comments that Penis makes in this regard at the end of the Averroes section in the context of the above discussion that was informed by Platonic political theory. Penis contends, quote, as far as legislation goes, Moses' task was twofold. One, to institute laws and commandments different from and better than those that were enforced at the time among the pagans of that part of the world, and two, to provide for certain continuity. Thus, he could and did reform the religious laws dealing with sacrifices, but could not, in the face of the universal uses prevalent at that time, have advocated sacrifices altogether. End of quote. Several sentences later, Penis adds, again with no reference to Maimonides' philosophic sources, that Maimonides, quote, asserts that the main purpose of the Mosaic legislation was to make the religious laws, in quotes, less burdensome than they were among the pagans, end of quote. And finally, Maimonides concludes the Averroes section by stating that, quote, Maimonides' defense of the law of the Torah does not or does not altogether rest upon the assumption that absolutely speaking, it is the best conceivable law. His contention is that under the circumstances, no better law could have been instituted, and changing it would destroy the Jewish community. That's in quotation marks. Changing it would destroy the Jewish community. End of quote. Thus, this penis defines as an apologetic purpose on the part of Maimonides. I have presented only a part of what I see as Venus' commentary on Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed, which is integrated and sometimes hidden behind his magisterial survey of the philosophic influences on the Guide of the Perplexed. In my opinion, it certainly provides a second level of reading in addition to Venus' philological task. Thank you. Yes, uh, some questions? Sure. Questions for 
Ideen davon auch keine. Ja? Ähm, you're right, there's a lot of discussion about. I, I can't hear you. There's a lot of discussion about the platonic influence on but Plato's political thought, kind of my mind, he was his essay. Uh, where would that influence have come from? I mean, I think it's certainly evidence that, that, that my mom was read her. Hey, first of all, no, he, he certainly read Al Farabi. And Al Farabi, you know, Al Farabi read the Republic, Al Farabi read the laws. Al Farabi world books where he wrote a commentary on the laws, he, he maybe he wrote a commentary on the Republic. Um, he uh, wrote a book, Fusula uh, Madani, which seems to be based on knowledge of the statesman. Um, so uh, he had, at least in that way, But he also had translations, just as Al Farabi had translations. What exactly he had, you know, I can't tell you for sure, but if Al Farabi had uh, the laws and Al Farabi had the Republic and maybe the statesman, then there's a good chance that. But the wrote a commentary. Averroes wrote a commentary, but. Yeah, but I, the only times that Maimonides after Maimonides saw the Maimonides really about the Tiberius, not the, not the Republic. And uh, granted, there's a lot of indirect no, no question, absolutely no question. But certainly, but, Penis cites Plato more than Maimonides does. That's exactly. Penis makes Plato a major influence on Maimonides. But the best you could say, I think, is that the influence is, uh, uh, is very indirect. In fact, the citations so to the Tyrius are really, in fact, citations well, of Perhaps that. Perhaps I could say that even more proves the point that when uh, Venus wrote his introduction, he wasn't necessarily just writing about philosophic sources that Maimonides used directly or Absolutely. overtly Absolutely. in the guide. And I think he perceived, at least Venus perceived, the influences that found their way there through Al-Farabi. I don't know if it's through Averroes, I, I, you know, but I think just as Averroes received uh, these words, there's a good chance my mind will be set up to them. Yeah? So you didn't just think about uh, this as discussion of the challenge of Satanism in my mind? Uh, again, I think it's designed to show uh, it's designed to show what it is that Judaism was up against. I think that may also be set the point that uh, uh, it's made in, in Arya's uh, uh, discussion, but it's, it's the same show what Maimonides was, what Moses maybe was up against. Uh, but uh, but for Maimonides, it's designed to show how it was that the law had to make improvements in the, in the way that we see here, but that we shouldn't demand the law to be totally perfect because it had to deal with real people that were living in a real world that was like that world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's an expression in Hebrew which says that Ahon Ahon Habib. The last one is most of love. And in this context of the conference, indeed, Joseph Stern is uh, was on the all of us. And, uh, and it's an expression of gratitude that he takes on the role of closing the conference. And I'm certain to be an enlightening as well. Please. Well, somebody had to have the last word. You know, the friends had to say, this is the word that which there will be no later. Okay. Um, again, I just want to thank Jim and Zeb and Jeff and Natasha, um, for most of all, all the speakers, for what has been, for me, just an exhilarating conference. I've learned a huge amount. Um, Remarkably, remarkably, two days ago, I remembered, I completely forgot about this, that Ralph and I, in 1988, I think, tried to organize a conference on the occasion of the 25th anniversary 
of the translation, the publication of the translation. And we, I'm sure we invited a number of the people who are here. I don't remember. Um, and yeah, you yeah, yeah. were born. He was very excited about it. We applied to the NEH, we were turned down. And I haven't looked again at the referee's comments, but I do remember that there one of the, the criticisms was that we did not give sufficient prominence to Latin philosophy. Um, and this is just, I mean, this conference, I think, is evident of how far we've come as, you know, in the study of medieval philosophy um, in those 25 years. But my greatest regret, of course, is that. Um, Professor Penis himself is not here at this time. He would have loved it. Um, <clears throat> so, this paper, in a much abbreviated form, originated as the second half of the Shlomo Penis lecture that I gave last May in Jerusalem. For that lecture, I was asked by the Shlomo Penis Society to discuss specifically the impact of Penis' translation, including the introductions, on the contemporary study of Maimonides' philosophy, the study of medieval Jewish philosophy, and philosophy more generally. In the talk, I distinguish three kinds of impact. First, what I call the presence of Peterson's translation in contemporary discussions. These are the Amazon rankings I mentioned on Sunday. Second, the influence by way of the content of his views. And third, the influence of his translation the influence that translation and introduction have had by way of what I call setting an agenda. What I mean by setting an agenda or a program is that the influence lies not in the acceptance of a position, doctrine, or interpretation, but in setting a group of problems or questions to be addressed as goals in future research. Influence by agenda setting can lead as much to positions that challenge or refute those of the agenda setter as to ones that confirm his initial views. What counts is the common set of problems or research goals or concerns. Nowadays, penis is most often associated with two agendas, which are often linked together, but in fact are in deep tension. Both, to make matters more perplexing, are present in his introduction to the guide, although the first is much more prominent. The first agenda is that the guide is to be read as a political work whose intention turns on distinguishing its exoteric and esoteric meanings, the exoteric typically identified with the law or religious tradition, the esoteric with philosophy and the truth. The second agenda, which became prominent in Peterson's work, only beginning with his classic paper of 1979, The Limitations of Human Knowledge of Ordov Rabi and Baja and Maimonides, addresses the limitations of human knowledge of metaphysics and their consequences for human happiness and perfection, given that, quote, the human intellect can only cognize objects perceived by the senses and the images deriving from sense data, end quote, and point that no one, this is again, quote, no scientific certainty can be achieved with regard to objects that are outside the sublunar world. As you all know, Peterson's view of the limitations of the intellect with respect to met metaphysics has elicited much criticism, criticism and resistance, including from a number of scholars sitting in this room. It would not be an exaggeration to say that this issue has been the most lively topic in the Maimonidean literature for the last 20 years. But my topic today is not whether Peters was right in his reading of Maimonides, but with Peters' own agendas. Penis 1963, the author of the introduction, is often contrasted with the later Penis of 1979. But it's striking that all the main ingredients, and this was mentioned by Sarah and by, I think, by Ken earlier, all the main ingredients for the 1979 position are already cited and present in the translator's introduction of 1963. A brief outline of Al Farabi's controversial remarks, his lost commentary on the Nicomachean ethics, that the only happiness in this world is, is this worldly, that it's political happiness, that all beings and it's all knowledge are sensible or ultimately based on sensory knowledge of corporeal bodies, and that any kind of material existence, say the immaterial immortality of the soul, is nothing but an old wives' tale. Peter also mentions in the introduction.
introduction, and then to files report about Farabi, and then Bach's defense of him, and then Bach's two, own two theories of human knowledge of immaterial beings, and Averroes' critique about Farabi's conception of the Heimlich intellect and his denial of human conjunction with the active intellect. Penis writes, quote, It can be argued that these views of Al Farabi, set forth in a work known to my mind, these may legitimately be taken into account in an interpretation of Maimonides' philosophy, end quote. It can be argued, and may legitimately be taken into account, yet Penis does not advocate this hypothesis. Why not? Why did Penis not draw the conclusion in 1963 that he later drew in 1979? Why the change in agenda? I'll suggest two reasons summed up in the names of two figures. Averroes and Spinoza. First, Averroes, and this in part is meant to address Frank's question earlier. Very much like many of Maimonides' 13th and 14th century commentators, Penis 63 read the guide through the lens of Averroes. And this, despite the fact that Penis writes, as we've heard, that there's no conclusive proof that at the time of the writing of the guide, Maimonides was in any way influenced by Averroes' doctrines. Nonetheless, Venus goes on to say that a comparison between Maimonides and Averroes would be instructive, that's his word, in view of their common culture, in view of their common culture, not just their Andalusian origins, but their, quote, similar naturalistic hard-headedness as members of the Spanish and Aristotelian school. Hence, he writes, the problems with which the two were concerned were identical. So by classifying Maimonides with Averroes, despite their different solutions or positions, Maimonides is pre- penis is projecting a particular agenda onto the guy. One such agenda-setting problems, which I'll return, has to do with the 12th century crisis in astronomy in Spain, for which Averroes and Maimonides proposed entirely different solutions. But a second such agenda-setting issue is that Penis takes my mind his main concern to have been with what I call a meta-philosophical question, a question about philosophy and its relation to religion or law. Are philosophy and religion compatible, identical, or in contradiction with each other? This question was a primary concern of Averroes in the Decisive Treatise, Okay. It also dominated my mind these 13th and 14th century commentators, and more recently, this metaphilosophical question was the main concern of Leo Strauss, and then in the introduction of Jesus himself. Both these medieval and contemporary students of Maimonides share one agenda, although they give one, they give opposed answers to the question it poses. The medievals tried to show that not only are philosophy and the Torah compatible, but that the true inner meaning of the Torah is, it's identical to philosophy. Strauss and Pina 63 share the same Averroistic agenda, the same problem and concern with the relation between philosophy and the law, but draw the opposite conclusion. The two stand in unsurmountable opposition. It's significant that the central figure for this agenda for Penis in the introduction is not Al-Farabi as it was for Strauss, but Averroes. Okay. And at the end of the lecture, we'll see one reason why. It's in the section of the introduction devoted to Averroes that Penis says that for both Maimonides and Averroes, quote, mankind is essentially divided into philosophers, the few capable of grasping philosophical doctrines, and, quote, the multitude of non-philosophers of the religious community. Of course, there are also differences between the two Cordobian philosopher jurists, their attitudes to the Kalam, and the possibility of upper class mobility for the multitude to rise to the rank of philosophers. But it's in connection to Averroes that Peter's most emphasizes, quote, the danger of philosophy for religious belief, a danger that was not minimized by either Maimonides or Averroes, that may obligate the philosopher in turn to, quote, dissemble or at least to refrain from giving the public expression to his true opinions. And Penis emphasizes that both Maimonides and Averroes also attempt to, quote, normalize the philosopher's position in society by issuing legal, quote, pronouncements on the religious duty of philosophizing. And you all know about that. Now, the Averroistic conception of philosophy which conceives the deity as an intellect, presupposes the absolute superiority of the theoretical life and of the intellectual virtues, which is incompatible with Penis' 79 position on strong limitations on the human intellect that exclude theoretical perfection. 
The same view of the absolute superiority and realizability of theoretical perfection leads P. 63 to reject the idea that, the end, that at the end of the guide, quote, my mind has adopted the quasi Kantian idea that the ordinary moral virtues and moral notions were of greater importance and value than the intellectual virtues and the theoretical way of life. That is, it leads him to reject the very interpretation of the closing paragraph of the guide that he will draw in 1979. In sum, the idealistic metaphilosophical question concerning the relation between philosophy and law is one factor that orients penis 63's reading of the guide. In turn, the presuppositions of this agenda lead Pina 63 not to draw the 79 conclusions from his al farabi sources. In contrast to this metaphilosophical concern with the relation between philosophy and the law, Pina 79 is concerned with the classical philosophical question. In what does man's ultimate goal and man's felicity consist? And as a corollary of this question, if one takes that goal and felicity to be intellectual, is it in fact humanly achievable? Can material bodily humans have knowledge of immaterial beings like God and the separate intellects or in metaphysics? Peter calls this philosophical question, quote, one of the most perplexing problems posed by the guide because the knowledge that excludes metaphysics, knowledge of God and immaterial intelligences, can hardly be, quote, man's final end, that is, ultimate perfection. Based on the very same text of Ibn Baja, Al-Qurabi, and Averroes that he mentions in the 63 introduction, Pina 79 then concludes in a complete turnabout that, quote, man cannot possibly have knowledge of God, and that the concluding paragraph of the guide follows from Maimonides' critical or skeptical epistemology that renders impossible theoretical perfection. The, quote, highest perfection of man is instead, quote, the practical way of life, the bios practicos, which is superior to the theoretical. What do you mean by bios practicos is another question. Thus, Peter's later philosophical agenda has diametrically opposed implications to those of his earlier meta-philosophical agenda. The second figure, which theologically dominates the, the translator's introduction to the guide, is Spinoza toward whom Pina 63 points Maimonides. Spinoza surfaces a number of times in the introduction, sometimes in surprising places. For example, in his discussion of Maimonides' addition of a fourth cause to Alexander's three causes of disagreement in part one, chapter 31, which are the, the fourth causes habit and upbringing, which in turn led the multitude to, to believe in God's corporeality because they were, quote, habituated to and brought up in, on highly regarded texts whose external meaning is indicative of the corporeality of God and other imaginings with no truth in them. On this fourth cause, Penis comments, Maimonides contrasts his own times, which he seems to hold are dominated by superstition, to use Spinoza's term and that of the philosophers of the Enlightenment, he contrasts that, his own times, with Greek antiquity in which the philosophers who aspired to know the true nature of things did not have to struggle against the dead hand of traditional belief. And this, notwithstanding the fact that Maimonides knew very well that the Greeks were pagan with their own religious beliefs and observances and superstitions, but which, which he, quote, apparently, this is Peter speaking, apparently chose not to mention. So Venus portrays Maimonides as an enlightenment philosopher in the image of Spinoza combating superstition, the paradigm of which is the traditional beliefs of religion. Now contrast that depiction with Venus's analysis of the fourth cause of disagreement, again, having an upbringing in the appendix to the 1979 paper. There, Venus singles out a new problem, he says, posed by the fact that Maimonides in 131, seems to hold that our times, when people are brought up to venerate scripture and religious texts, are, quote, less propitious for the acquisition of true knowledge and avoidance of errors than during Alexander's pagan times. But this, he writes, is, quote, difficult to reconcile with my mind these well-known position, according to which, quote, the hints given in scriptural parables and riddles, quote, help those who have the capacity to become philosophers 
to achieve, to achieve true knowledge. To address that tension, Jesus now changes the very problem Maimonides is addressing in 131. Producing a text of Aristotle from the metaphysics and therapeutic translation, which Venus has asserted is a source of Maimonides' idea that habituation to and reverence for religious texts is a source of corruption, he nonetheless finds no textual support for the complementary claim that in antiquity the Greeks were less apt, that's his word, to adopt false beliefs given the religious traditions to which they were habituated. Likewise, he finds in Iberio's commentary on the metaphysics no quote explicit affirmation of the superiority of paganism over monotheism. Rather, based on Iberio's proemium to the moral commentary on the physics, Penis suggests a rather different explanation according to which it's not religious doctrines or the law inculcated through uncritical acceptance of revered familiar texts that's an obstacle to the acquisition of philosophical truth. The real problem is that on the one hand, philosophers have become corrupted by, quote, people who corrupt the law and no longer hold in esteem the ideal of intellectual perfection. And on the other hand, people in general don't consider philosophers, quote, worthy of playing a part in the life of the city. That is, a very is a saying that in his, quote, in his times, most of the philosophers are swayed by worldly desires and do not, in fact, deserve to be regarded as part of the city. Picking up on a suggestion of Steve Harvey's in his dissertation, Peter suggests that Averroes in my mind may be reacting here to him and his recommendation that philosophers make themselves strangers to the city. Instead, they quote, want to integrate philosophy into the life of the community. So the issue here for Penis, so the integrating philosophy really is exactly the opposite of an opposition between philosophy and the law. Thus the issue here for Penis is not as it was in the the obstacle posed by religious truth, aka superstition, to the spread of philosophical truth, my mind is speaking at Spinoza, but rather the harm caused by the prejudices of Islamic and Jewish society to the moral character of individuals, and especially philosophers. In 79, in short, Penis is not concerned with the metaphilosophical question of the relationship between the law and philosophy, religion and philosophy, but with tense relations between two classes of people, followers and especially leaders of religious communities and, philosopher and philosophers. This is a very different story. The most common stimulistic influence on Pena 63 is undoubtedly his analysis of Guide 168, which we've heard about, which we've heard earlier, according to which God is generally admitted to God by the philosophers to be an intellect and act identical to both the intellectually cognizing subject and the intellectually cognizing object. Pena 63 privileges this chapter with its positive characterization of God over the chapters of negative attributes, according to which no affirmative description of the deity is allowable. His reason, Pena states, is, quote, to follow Maimonides is to their logical conclusion, that God may be identical with the system of sciences, including physical science, which he says, Pena says, is a higher valuation of natural science than any that may be found in a race. The hints Penis has in mind are a series of independent theses that he sews together. The first is the Aristotelian source for the dictum of 168, the one known text of metaphysics, Lambda, chapter 9, which became a stock formula for Aristotelians, but itself means that God cognizes only himself, okay? Not anything else. For any other candidate for knowledge, we not need the excellence demanded for a divine intellect, where the excellence is determined by the object of knowledge, what's known. Prima facie, then, this would exclude God's knowledge of universals or forms, and especially those of the natural world. However, as Venus showed in a later essay, some distinctive metaphysical conceptions in Themistius' commentary on Book Lambda and their place in the history of philosophy, insofar as God is the imminent cause of the formal and final structure of the universe, and knowing himself as such a cause, he has so facto knows all his effects, including the formal structure of the natural world. So God's self-knowledge includes indeed knowledge of the quote, workings of the natural order, 
that is the subject matter of physics, or what Maimonides also calls the attributes of action, the scientific understanding of the natural world, to which Maimonides refers as, this is in 332, the divine, i.e., natural actions, a formula that Penis notes, quote, forcibly calls the mind Spinoza. Moreover, given the identity of the knower into an object of intellection, it then follows that God not only knows, but it is identical with the formal structure of the natural world. From these assumptions, he then concludes, quote, that the knowledge of the system of nature may represent the essence of God. That was the quotation that the judge read. This, Peter concludes, makes God, quote, something coming perilous, perilously close to Spinoza's attribute of thought, or he was into it, of God. Zedlarby and Carlos Frankel have very convincingly argued, perhaps carrying out Penis's hints, that these passages in 168 were almost certainly a source for Spinoza. Our question, however, is not whether Spinoza should be read by Maimonides, but whether Maimonides' own text should be read by Spinoza, as Penis 63 indeed reads it. The most serious difficulty is that Spinoza's God also possesses, as you know, the attribute of extension. So if one takes my mind, he's got to be not only identical with the formal structure of the natural world, but also with its extension and matter, which is the medieval terminology, then we end up attributing an attribute of extension of corporal reality to God, a consequence that one would think is absolutely excluded by my mind's unqualified opposition to idolatry, which is first and foremost conceiving of God as a body. There's also a second problem. In 168, my mind goes out of his way for the first time in the Aristotelian tradition, as Venus emphasizes, to compare the conception of the divine intellect in the metaphysics with the conception of the human intellect of the animal. Both intellects, divine and human, turns out are identical in act to their subject and object. The only difference between between those moments, the only difference being um, those moments when the human intellect is not in act, but only in potentia. But if we then couple that thesis with my mind is further claim that the divine attributes of action, namely the scientific understanding of natural phenomena, are, quote, the only positive knowledge of God possible to man, it follows that when the human cognizes this knowledge of nature, the human subject, intellect and act, and the natural order that is intellectually apprehended, are themselves one mechanical. In other words, given the theory of the intellect of 168 and the unity of the subject and object of intellection, both God and man turn out to be identical with the system of the natural sciences. And if this conclusion were not disturbing enough, it would further seem to follow, although Penis does not explicitly draw the conclusion, that the intellectually cognizing deity and the human intellect and act are themselves identical. Like the conclusion that God has an attribute of extension or is corporeal, this conclusion is entirely incompatible with my mind's insistence that God is incomparable, unique, and unrelated to anything else. Or, I, I, have, I wrote parenthetically, one wonders, is Jesus' point that my mind's philosophical view is in fact that God is corporeal? There is insistence that God is not a body, is the view only of the Torah, or the Torah on its exoteric understanding, or that the esoteric truth is that the literal or external sense of the Torah is the philosophical truth. Any of these consequences turns the metaphilosophical question on its head. In the introduction, Peace concludes his discussion of 168 by emphasizing that one or the other, either the negative theology spelled out in chapter 50 to 63, part one, according to which no positive statement about God can be known, or the positive characterization of God in 168, quote, represents my mind these real opinion. One of them represents my mind these real opinion. Prima facie, I agree with that is admissible. However, having said that, and then goes on to imply from my mind's example of the human intellect's abstraction of a form using as an example a material object, a piece of wood, and from the analogy between the human and divine intellects, the Maimonides' divine intellect inclines toward the spinozistic positive characterization of 168, that God is identical with the, um, with the world. And to those who might suggest that Maimonides himself failed to realize to what conclusions his own reasoning had drawn him, 
To those critics, Peter's famously replies that such a portrayal of the great eagle would amount to, quote, a grave and very implausible accusation of muddle headedness. Thus far, Peter 63. Peter 79 does not elaborate all these deeply problematic consequences that follow from the Spinozistic greeting and privilege of 168. For Spinoza is no longer on stage, and only makes a brief off-stage appearance in a footnote to which I'll return. But the important point is that my penis's agenda has shifted. It's now directed toward the philosophical problem that turns to his critical epistemology, which he presumably thinks privileges the unknowable God of the chapters of negative theology. Thus he writes, quote, It's obvious that if my mind is epistemology is accepted, man cannot possibly have the knowledge of God that's presupposed in the dictum of the philosophers. In this respect, the analogy drawn between God and the intellection in 168 does not and probably is not intended to prove anything. Now, Penis emphasizes Maimonides' characterization of the dictum as shukra, to be admitted, which Penis now compares to the Arabic term mashura, from the same root, the term Maimonides uses throughout the guide for conventional moral notions that are the objects of the imagination rather than intellect. And which Penis describes as, quote, notions that are generally admitted without either being self evident and immutable truths or having been proven by rigorous reasoning. Penis does not explain why Maimonides discusses the, Penis does not explain why Maimonides discusses the dictum of the philosophers in 168 if it's not meant to prove anything. And elsewhere I have argued that not only is the dictum of the philosophers generally admitted, that is not demonstrably true, but that in ascribing it to the philosophers, my mind is disavowing it as his own view. Instead, the point of the chapter is a critique of the philosopher's representation of God or the divine intellect. Moreover, the significance of 168 for Penis 79 is that it motivates a distinction between what he calls two strata in the Aristotelian philosophical doctrine. One strata of, quote, intellectually cognized notions whose truth is absolute that forms what he calls a coherent system, a science, both understood and well-ordered. And a second stratum that is, quote, more comprehensive and ambitious, but consists of propositions, quote, that cannot be cognized by the human intellect, and in most is really probable. The first stratum, Peter's identified with terrestrial physics, the second with celestial physics and metaphysics. Note that this is a, this is a distinction within Aristotelian philosophy, not between philosophy and the law. In fact, in saying that, quote, metaphysics falls in the second stratum because its conceptions fall beyond the limits of the empiricist, of his empiricist epistemology, Peter adds that he's using the term metaphysics, or metaphysical, not in its medieval sense, but, quote, as in many modern writings, in a somewhat pejorative sense. And quote, is that another possible designation of these conceptions <clears throat> that transcend the limits of human knowledge would be to describe them as forming a part of a philosophical theology. Here, the term theology has an epistemological meaning only indirectly related to religion and not at all to Kalam, as Maimonides 63 defines that term. Peter writes, these notions that fall beyond the human intellect, quote, provide the philosophers with a system of beliefs somewhat analogous, somewhat analogous, as far as the truth function is concerned, to the religious beliefs of lesser worlds. I'm not sure I fully understand Venus here, what, is, what, he, what he intended by this phrase, truth function, and so on. And it would have been good had he explained what it is for a philosopher to, quote, believe these notions, what kind of epistemic commitment they make, but it's clear that the term theology for Peter 79 is closer to its, to its sense in the title, The Theology of Aristotle, than it is in the theology of Judaism. Remarkably, the one time Spinoza is mentioned in the 79 paper is in that footnote, commenting on the Spinozistic conclusion that God is a corporeal substance, which Peter says is, quote, in flavored contradiction to my mind's doctrine, he adds, quote, some remarks may engender the suspicion invalidated by other passages 
but the God of my mind has an intimate connection with the cosmos. That in fact, he may be conceived, if we use physicistic terms, as an idea whose idiotic is the world. It is, of course, difficult or impossible to reconcile a conception of this sort with my mind as epistemology, but it could form part of this philosophical theology. So here, far from being my mind as esoteric intention, the spinocistic reading of 168 is theology. To see how far Pina 79 has moved from the metaphilosophical agenda that confronts philosophy with the law or religion, consider how he views the Mishnah Torah in his later writing. He knows that it's, quote, significant, as my mind reads himself explicitly states in the God, that the conception of the deity of 168 is also set forth in the Mishnah Torah in the Hilchah um, the the laws of the foundation of the law. But it's not only that, quote, in both works, the thesis forms a part of a theological system, which may be believed or cannot be proved to be true. Mina Pinas proposes as a, quote, tenable hypothesis that whenever Maimonides refers in the guide to the Mishnah Torah, either by name or by reference to our compilation, Talmud that, quote, these references are at least sometimes used by Maimonides to indicate that the passages in the guide in which they occur pertain to theology or a theological philosophy which is not wary of putting forward assertions that the limited human intellect is unable to verify. Penis is not saying that all propositions of the Mishnah Torah are assertions that lie beyond the human intellect, or that what distinguishes them is this feature. Nor does he distinguish the Mishnah Torah as law in opposition to philosophy, as quote, a text addressed to the general run of men, of men, as opposed to a text addressed to a small number of people who are able to understand by themselves. I'm sure you know who said that. Instead, he's giving us a hermeneutical rule for interpreting the God. When you find a cross-reference to the Mishnah Torah in the God, as in the case of the unity of the intellect, or his other example, the immortality of the soul, this means that the thesis in question is of a certain epistemological kind, which distinguishes it from other philosophical and scientific claims. The new agenda is philosophical to pursue a skeptical question. And the role of the Mishnah Torah, the references to the Mishnah Torah, is really a key to how to interpret all right, the God. In a similar vein, Peter's hermeneutics shifts from 63 to 79. Peter's opens his introduction to the guy, referring in the first footnote to Strauss's literary character of the guy that perplexed, by contrasting, quote, the methods of exposition of the Mishnah Torah and the guy, how the one introduces order out of the chaotic disorder of the unit <coughs> literature, while the other, quote, order is turned into disorder, though for good and sufficient reasons. Peter does not explicitly, explicitly mention the terms exoteric and esoteric, but he, tell, he uses them. He tells us that Maimonides contempt that Maimonides, I'm sorry, but he tells us that Maimonides' contemporary, in the number of people at the time of Maimonides, was, quote, better prepared than modern readers to grasp intentions they hinted at in the veiled language and doctrines deliberately obscured by an extremely unsystematic method of exposition. This because, quote, philosophical science may be dangerous, that the study of philosophy may bring about that state of perplexity due to an unresolved conflict between religious tradition and non-religious knowledge. That strict precautions must be taken to keep the, re the average reader, who's also an average man, in the dark concerning the philosophic solution propounded by Maimonides. I could quote where he goes on, but you get the point. In contrast, in 79, more precisely in the later paper published in 1986, the philosophical report of Maimonides' Hamathic works and the report of the guy in the perplexed, he just argues that the quote, somewhat facile assumption that Maimonides' Hamathic words are less philosophical or Aristotelian than the guy is by no means true. Instead of a binary theory of interpretation, exoteric, esoteric, Penis now proposes four what he calls discourses that may be discerned in the God. A traditional religious discourse, which includes allegorical interpretations of anthropomorphic expressions in the Bible. Right? So the, the popular discourse, the traditional discourse, already is 
is figurative reinterpretation of the meal. And the area second, the Aristotelian discourse. Third, a critical discourse that challenges the possibility of the science of metaphysics and claims to serve to regard incorporeal beings and extraterrestrial physics. And four, a Sufi or mystical dis discourse that emerges in 351. Once again, this change reflects a radical change in agenda. We, as I said on, on Sunday, already in the introduction, all right, um, to, the, to the guide, we find P, we find P is presenting this multi-dimensional my mind is impacted on by all sorts of sources, all right? But now we see in this hermeneutics, all right, it's no longer shaped by a virilities, it's shaped by, as Sarah said earlier today, all different kinds of audiences that he's addressing all right, in the guy. Right? It's really a much more complicated hermeneutics, who he's addressing, the language that he adopts to address them. Um, I'm going to skip a, a, a very complicated section here now on his um, use of Ibn Baja um, to explain the opening paragraph about the lightning flashes um, in the beginning of um, the introduction of the guy. The bottom line, in, in, just to summarize it, he uses in, in, in the introduction to the guy, it turns out that those who see the flashes um, he focuses on those who actually see the flashes rather than on the people who see the light reflected from the bodies, the polished bodies. And the main question is whether the people who see the flashes are prophets and the one who sees the flashes continuously, Moses, or whether it's Aristotle, which is what you would have expected, all right, using from the same sort of terminology that, that the philosophers themselves use with Gabi and that he thinks Ibn Baja would have used, all right? So that's the conflict between the philosophy and law. And his solution, he doesn't settle the question, he says, my mind is about that deliberately ambiguous, all right? In 79, all the focus, the, 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 the people who see the flashes are prophets, right? All the focus is on those who understand by reflection from the polished bodies, that is, the natural scientists who engage in theoretical science, but it derives from sensory perception, all right? The prophets are the express, are the ones who express theology, knowledge by beyond, all right? The limits of human knowledge, all right? So again, completely different interpretation of the Ibn Baja in the two contexts. So what I've been arguing is that Peace's metaphilosophical reading of the guy in 1963, through the lens of Averroes, with his long range sights set on Spinoza, set an agenda that is a set of concerns and problems that block the critical or skeptical implications he later draws in 1979, which arise from a completely different philosophical agenda directed toward answering questions about human happiness and in turn dependent questions about the perfection of the human intellect. Changes of agenda of this sort can have major consequences in determining which problems are addressed. In my um, peer lecture in June, or in May, I, last year, I spoke in length about a passage at the end of my mind's presentation of the crisis in 12th century Andalusia over Ptolemaic astronomy versus Aristotelian cosmology and celestial physics. In 224, what people call the scandalon of science, people have talked referred to that earlier today, okay, which he my mind uses in order to motivate a skeptical view for the possibility of superlunar scientific knowledge. In the passage in question, my mind seems to deny that it's possible to have knowledge of the existence of God to what he elsewhere calls the greatest proof, which is based on the revolution of the heavens. The passage in question, which comes at the end of that chapter, 224, which seems to contradict all of my mind these other statements in the guide, drew Samuel Identity Bowen's attention and elicited, and elicited a hasagat, a critical note, in his translation, in the margins. Apparently, a later scribe inter interpolated the critical note into the text, that's what we think, leading them to a new Hebrew text. In 1861, Solomon, so that was in 1200, right? Okay? In 1861, Solomon Moon noted that the, that the edition was not supported by the Arabic text tradition and rejected it. In 1959, Yehuda Ebn Shmuel cited Ibn Tibon's Asagai's comment, which he discovered in the National Library, noted that it was based on philosophical rather than a textual ground, but nonetheless retained the inundation. And in 1972, Prof. Kappa 
which criticized the Bimti Bone for amending the text, what he thought wasn't was, was an Bimti Bone the amendation, and offered a very Hebrew translation of the original Arabic text. So, in roughly 1213, when Ibn Tibon published this translation, we really don't know exactly when the scribe did this, all right? Until 1861 for Monk, or 1959, that is Joel, or 1972 for Alcapa, a general silence prevailed, okay, about my mind's statement in 224. This very cosmic statement that we can't prove the existence of God in the revolution of the Spirit, which he also says you can't. That's the greatest proof, okay? In sharp contrast, since the 80s, there's been at least 15 papers or publications on that one sentence in the guide, four by distinguished scholars in this very room, in one issue of the journal Aleph. But why the almost absolute silence over the concluding statement of 224 for almost 800 years, or 600, 800 years? And why the flurry of activity in the last 30 years? Well, whether one was reading the problematic Arabic text before 1979 or the amended text, I conjecture, he would have simply been blind to the problematic character of 224, because it was, it was so inimical to the metaphilosophical agenda that dominated all thinking about the God. It was only because people shifted agendas to the philosophical problem can a human actually achieve the knowledge of supermoon or metaphysical truths that's necessary for theoretical and intellectual perfection and happiness? It's only because of that that this passage is drawing so much attention, both by scholars who believe that it is possible for humans to achieve intellectual perfection, and by those who take the passage to support their denial of the possibility. This is a good example of influence by agenda setting, both the silence generated by the one agenda and the loud discussion by the other. There remains one final question. What caused penis to change agendas? And this is a question to which I had no answer in May in Jerusalem when I gave the penis lecture, but here's a sad one. It's an absolutely remarkable fact that I, I only discovered briefly in the last couple of weeks. The Trump penis's first sustained publication on my mouthpiece is his translator's introduction to the God. That was the first long essay that he wrote on my mouth, and he published on my mouthpiece. Prior to 1963, his only other publication on my mouthpiece, three pages long, was the Excursus on Free Will and Determinism, an appendix to the Abu Bar Barakat's Poetics and Metaphysics, published in 1960. And before that, there was the one lecture on the guy from 1955 that I mentioned on Sunday that remained unpublished until April 1998. That published lecture is the final entry in the official bibliography of Penis' writings on the website of the Penis Society. Echoing the famous phrase in the guide, it is indeed the first and the last. Reading the translator's introduction, all of this would think, of course, that this is the fruit of years and years of research and thought and investigation of Maimonides and his Arabic predecessors. And in fact, there's no reason to think that it was not. Moreover, all that research and thought must have contained, as we see from the evidence of the introduction, Deep ruminations on Al Farabi and Ibn Baja on the Lost Commentary and their effect on Maimonides, and the place of Maimonides in the history of ideas extending to Spinoza and Kant. This is already evident, as I said, from Penis's introduction to the God. And among this, I would hypothesize that Penis's own position, or at least his inclination, from the very start of the Amory, from the start of his career, from at least 1963, and at the end, was the critical Al-Farabian one, although it subsisted for most of that time in his head and not on paper. Why then the manifest right turn for the very reason Spinoza in 1963? Well, in 1954-55, Leo Strauss spent a year as a visitor at the university in Jerusalem. 
As Zen Harvey showed in the paper he delivered last summer at the World Congress of Jewish Studies, which he was kind enough to share with me, that year was a milestone for the study of Maimonides in the second half of the 20th century, and especially in Israel. Without going into details, in that year, Strauss turned Mishayahu Leibovitz into a Maimonidean in one strike, and I suggest now Penis into a Maimonidean of another, the Averroistic Spinozistic brand. Under the impact of Strauss's intellectual charisma and presence, and this is by the fact that Strauss and Penis have been friends since Berlin, Penis was stimulated to give the 1955 lecture, which is in anticipation of the 63 introduction. Strauss and he began to plan the translation project, as Ralph said from the correspondence, okay? And Penis' own thoughts were the introduction, and whatever shape he then thought it would take for the thoughts of the introduction began to take shape. But what I tried to show is how Penis, even while making this right turn and writing the introduction, was still ruminating over the critical reading of the guy, and at the same time finding himself in contorted positions trying to accommodate the agrarialistic, spinozistic agenda of the actual text. As the shadow of Strauss's presence faded with the end of his visit to Jerusalem, with the publication of the introduction, and undoubtedly Penis's own continued thoughts over the following years, as that process continued, the critical reading re-emerged, re-emerged in the light of day. But it was always there. The critical reading was Penis's own first and last reading of Maimonides' guide, momentarily eclipsed by the sudden, blinding appearance of a comment in the sky that appeared not out of nowhere, but out of Hyde Park. <laughs> I think we could express our gratitude to, to, to Joseph Eisenhower for our coming perspicacious questions. <laughs> Please, for comments. Oh, let me add one question to see. I don't know if there were three. Um, what's puzzling me is why in 79 he doesn't mention Abu Dhabi. But Abu Dhabi doesn't then reappear. I mean, I think the Abu Dhabi sort of eclipsed it in 68. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I did. 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 I Quite clear that there are lots of overlapping between Abu Dhabi and Abu Dhabi, yet in various papers that he uh, brought up, never appeared. Mm-hmm. We did not think that it would happen a significant event in the history of philosophy, at least not as much as I think. Any further questions or comments? Okay. Oh. Even the penis vintage 1963, he's full of hesitation. Yeah. I mean, it's true, as you said, that in the end he sides with Spinoza and uh, cuts down on guy 168. But he doesn't do it sort of slamming on the table. Uh, he, there are all kinds of doubts, hesitations, kind of in making this and making that. So, I don't know that he was even then he's not fully convinced. No, no, no. I'm saying that while he was writing the introduction, he's still thinking about the alpha. Yeah, I'm so I agree with you. And, and, he, and, he, and he's trying to fit together with the text. He's sort of overwhelmed by Strauss's you know, charisma and influence already present, all right? And so he's trying to sort of convince himself of this other reading, right? But the problems here, the problems here, you seem struggling. That's the end of it. All right. Steve? Yeah, just for a one read the it where I think Rory Penis was giving and going through some reminiscence to his father. I think he mentioned that the only scholar 
And some of you know that Venus held a special awe for Strauss. And uh, it seems to be uh, evident. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's true. One last question. Yeah. In doing research, you come to the various conclusions that you come to in addition to. I'm going to read if I were here. But that's not what I'm going to get at. In, in, in addition to reading the publications by various of these people, and for anybody else, is it difficult to get access to their files, to their papers, to their notes, to the things that they had when they were either teaching or learning? Um, are there file boxes full of notes that you can dig into to uh, get data in order to help you with uh, trying to figure out what is in someone's mind at any given time or what someone had access to or didn't have access to, like Adam Neal or anybody like that? It varies individually. We may have Strauss's archive here. We may have wealth of material. What about Phoenix? It's about, about Strauss, and it also contains these, these small number of letters that, speak, that Penis wrote to Strauss, which Joel Crane and I published a number of years ago. I said this on Sunday, because you would not hear that. Um, penis, it seems, um, <coughs> destroyed manuscripts and unpublished material. Um, so that we don't, what, what, we, what remains of his unpublished material, there are letters, this one lecture that was published in 1955. Diaries. He, he had no diary as far as I know. He, he had a novel, I said then, which was destroyed. But like the, the, letters that, the, the letters that his son gave me, I, I'm trying to remember, they weren't significant ones, I mean, but they're ones that he found in the back of drawers, but he just hadn't seen it, okay? Um, and it was really rather remarkable. He brought out to me, he brought out to me one day, in a plastic bag, this bound volume, which um, was, in a, it was in a plastic bag, Saki, you know, the first thing they give out in the supermarket. You know? His, this bound volume, he asked me, what is this? And I looked at it, and what it was that when, when Penis um, wrote the 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 Adams work, the Adams work, the book on Adams, he sent it to all the greatest scholars in the world. Islamists, we found out the magic, the stories of science, Thorndike, I remember, was in there. I mean all of them were in there. I mean, and and they wrote back, they wrote back on um, letters, commending it, right? And he was very proud of this. And he says, forget it, this was his Habilitian, Habilitian, right? This is um, and, um, and he was very proud of this. So this was the one thing which he'd actually, you know, made into like a scrapbook. But he kept it in a plastic bag. It worked. It worked, yeah. But, you know, that could have been, tr- that could have been thrown out of the garbage. I mean, or even if you didn't know what it was. I mean, I figured it out from just reading it, you know, most of that. But, um, so, it depends on the author. Some cases we don't have them here. And I think Zebra sort of said that when they went to the library after, they found no drafts. Okay. I mean, I, we, we also think that he probably just wrote them. I mean, what we have them. Oh, he had the he had all these things. Do you um, think all but he might have destroyed drafts, too. You know? Do you think all that has been exhausted? What there is a plan or is it not? What we do know is that, once again, to reiterate our gratitude to each of you and all of you. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.